For 59 years, we have been living in America and have never been to the national parks. And uh, so we decided to book a trip with our favorite company, Cosmos. The tour is called the National Parks and Canyons. And on this map, you can see that we started out in Denver and ended up in Vegas. We had 11 overnights in excellent hotels. The numbers on the map indicated where we stayed and for how many nights. And you can see that we traveled through Colorado and um, South Dakota and Wyoming and then briefly through Idaho, then Utah, then Arizona and ended up in Nevada. In the evening of the arrival date, we met our tour director, Chris, and his home is in New Mexico and we liked them right from the get-go. The bus, uh, or to pay the vehicle the proper respect, I think we should call it our coach, was a Citra, which was built by Mercedes. And this is a generic picture and not really our own coach. This, on the other hand, is our coach, with a room for, a room for 48 passengers, television sets, a complete audio-video system, and a toilet. And when Chris explained the layout for us, he said, the manufacturer of this coach, in his inscrutable wisdom, has located the toilet right over the hot engine. I suppose the thought being that they wanted to make sure that in case someone was going to use it, everybody would benefit from the aroma. The crux of the matter was, don't you dare use it. We were going to stop every two hours for a pit stop anyway. Our driver turned out to be a very pleasant, heavy-set woman wearing a black cowboy hat. She handled that big rig with great skill, and our travel companions came from the UK and from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And we Americans were definitely in the minority. These coach tours, in order to give everyone a shot at the good seats, had us move forward by two benches every morning. On our first day, we left early because it was a long trip to Cheyenne, and on the way we saw nodding mules. That's what Chris called those oil pumps that move up and down. We saw buffaloes, or to use the correct name, bison, and antelopes. They're called pronghorns. We also saw missile silos hidden behind security fences. Next we saw asps, and these are groups of trees, and they only grow as groups sharing one single root system for many trees. They look like birches. And next to the asps, there was lots of arid land with nothing but sagebrush. At this point, uh, we entered the state of Wyoming. And this is the home of the notorious company Halliburton. And the major product of the state is coal. And this was quite noticeable by the long freight trains loaded to the brim with coal. Now Dick Cheney, our ex-VP, used to be on the board of Halliburton. And Chris commented, our president has his home in this state. And when we looked at him sort of wondering, he said it straight. Well, wasn't he the real president? We came through Cheyenne, where the Wangler jeans are made, and then he showed us a shocking film, How the West Was Lost. The film shows how the Indians were slaughtered by the army about 150 years ago. And next we hit South Dakota. Already from a distance, we could see the construction site for the Crazy Horse Memorial. Crazy Horse was the Indian chief who defeated General Custer at the Little Bighorn, and the Indians are constructing an enormous memorial to the hero. They have already spent many years on the project, and it will take many more years before it is finished. Notice the hole. That is the armpit. Just imagine if the outstretched arm should be blown off when they blast. I guess a new mountain would have to be found. In the background you can see the blasting and in the foreground they erected a small model to show what the finished sculpture would look like. The size of the head is enormous and uh, the guy is going to look pretty ticked off. I think this picture is particularly interesting because it shows you the incredible size of the project. Look closely and you can see a tiny white spot in the lower right, near the corner. That is a van. And now look at the head. 
and you will get an idea of the size. Tonight we are going to spend the night in our hotel in Custer. But we still have enough spunk to participate in an extra event of dinner by cowboy music. The next day we booked a special tour through the uh, Custer State Park. Our coach was too wide to fit uh, through some of those narrow openings and so we were distributed among some smaller vehicles. Chris told us an interesting story. In the past the Indians were resettled on large tracts of undesirable land and today's Custer State Park area became a reservation and then oil was found there and so the Indians were again thrown out and settled somewhere else. The Indians objected to this treatment and filed a lawsuit against the government. The lawsuit uh, was, has still not been settled. The government offered them the ridiculous amount of a million dollars as compensation and the natives objected to this measly offer and they are still waiting to this day. Uh, this sign directs us to an interesting view. And this is the view. It's called the Needle's Eye Formation. Now you can see why our coach would have had a problem because with our minibuses we were able to navigate this tunnel. This is the other end of the tunnel where we reassembled our groups. Uh, this year this beautiful state park has suffered a great deal. Fires and tree diseases decimated the forest. And during the winter months prison inmates collect the dead wood and burn it. In this park uh, bison are running free but uh, at the end of the season before winter sets in the herds have to be thinned out because there's not enough feed for all of them what with the newborns and all. The roundup in October is an annual event. I'm sure you all want to know what happens to the selected ones. Well I got bad news for you unless you like buffalo burgers. These uh, cute little guys are prairie dogs. They live in holes in the ground and these homes are connected by tunnels and form a neat little settlement. Every once in a while one of these guys pops up and looks around to make sure everything is okay. They're really fun to watch. Donkeys, or I guess mules, are everywhere. They even come up to the cars. Lots of pronghorns as well. And after this tour we were dropped off at Mount Rushmore uh, where we joined the rest of our group. The horrific violation in exceptionally bad taste did start with this monstrosity but what the Indians are doing now, probably out of spite, beats all records. We were told that the head of Crazy Horse is so big that all four heads on Mount Rushmore would fit into it. Well I guess this is America and taste is not our strong point. The heads of Mount Rushmore represent Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson and Teddy Roosevelt. You may want to put your playback on pause to give you time to read this plank. It does sound like a cry for help, doesn't it? It states facts that should give us food for thought. And uh, I'll let this uh, stay here for a while so if you don't put it on pause to give you a little more time. We are now at the Tatanka Museum. It belongs to and is run by Sioux Indians. It shows the way the Indians lived in those days. And here Yuta is standing in front of a teepee. Uh, the next two pictures show huge sculptures of bison being driven down steep cliffs. That was the way the Indians killed bison. Leaving the museum we felt some shame as white men. Next stop, Deadwood, a town that used to be totally lawless back in 1876 during the Gold Rush days. An overview of the town of Deadwood. This here is Deadwood at night. It is said that Jack McCall killed here the Sheriff Wild Bill Hickok during a poker game back in those wild days. Two saloons claimed to be the place where it happened. 
and they are both right, well, somewhat. The one place can stake its claim by GPS coordinates, and the other one by some authentic memorabilia of the saloon at the time. This sign, dated uh, June 1876, points out how the town has grown during the last month and a half. And I let it run a little longer so you can read it. We found saloons and restaurants at every corner uh, with names like Miss Kelly or Gold Dust or Wild Bill, etc. We had dinner in one of those places and all I remember is that the food was great and the coffee was lousy. The doorknob on one of those bars is a revolver. And here you see a reconstruction of the fatal event when Hickok was shot. Strange though, I seem to see a TV hanging from a post. The next morning we started early, first up for lunch in Sheridan, and then on our way Chris showed us another film, The Story Never Told. It's the same story really, just from a different angle. And by now, because we, we knew where Chris's sympathies were. And uh, next we entered the Bighorn National Forest, and again there was evidence of severe tree damage caused by beetles and forest fires. There were 9,000 foot mountains, a beautiful little lake, and a pretty waterfall, and finally we arrived in Cody, which is known as the home of Buffalo Bill. We spent the night in log cabins, but uh, don't feel too bad about it, because they were part of the Holiday Inn chain and they were very comfortable. We had booked a rafting trip for the next day. This is uh, Jura being properly outfitted. And this is the bus that took us down to the banks of the Shoshone River. You can see us walking down for boarding. The rubber rafts were waiting already, and we ended up getting separated from our group, and then we joined the British group instead. Now this is what the boats looked like in the end. The people on the outsides had to row while the others were just dead weight. We were warned of possible out-of-boat experiences because of the sometimes violent rapids. And sure enough, the leader of the boat ahead of ours actually did fall into the water, but he was easily collected. We received the kind of diploma at the end of the tour. And during the trip we could see deer grazing, and in the evening we had dinner in Cody at Irma's in the famous Buffalo Bill Bar and Hotel. And next day, after a very long ride, we stopped at a Walmart for, as Chris explained, some retail therapy. And what he really meant was that we were to get us some sandwiches for lunch. Next, next stop will be Yellowstone. On the way, we saw chipmunks. Now they look kind of cute, but in our garden in upstate New York, they are a royal pain in the you-know-where. Just peruse the next five pictures showing the impressive scenery, though. I can't understand a word you're saying We've got a bad connection on our minds Communication's one thing We never seem to find Oh Lord, I'm sorry But there's trouble And uh, just as we are about to enter the actual park We see this grizzly bear popping up right next to us He's not to be disturbed But he lumbers alongside our bus uh, we also saw an elk right next to the road. 
At the entrance to the park, you can see our bus parked near the big lodge and hotel. At the reception, we saw a sign telling us that at 3.50, Old Faithful would give his performance. And of course, you know Old Faithful is the geyser that erupts at regular intervals. Old Faithful is known to be on time. To your left, you can see Chris talking to one of our passengers. And as we were walking around inside the lodge, we could hear German spoken. Sure enough, a bunch of Germans, all dressed in leather, <coughs> were telling us that they had rented Harleys and were touring the parks. Should any of you guys have similar ambitions, you can make arrangements by calling this number. Being an old biker, I was intrigued by this rather modern-looking one. It looked so very different from the other Harleys. And when it was time for the geyser eruption, we joined other people who were sitting on benches. Well, and then, right on the button it started. First, just a little smoke, then more and more intense until it became an impressive column, and then the process was reversed until it was just a little smolder. All I get is static when we're talking. You say my line is out of order all the time. We have nothing left in common. Your thoughts are not like mine. Oh Lord, I'm sorry, but there's trouble. And now we did our own exploring around the geyser field. Because besides Old Faithful, there are many smaller geysers as well. Occasionally we came across warnings not to get too close to those holes. Apparently a small child once fell into one of these holes and perished. There's trouble on the line From your heart to mine Oh Lord, I'm sorry that we're not getting through Here you see me taking a break and observe the wooden walkway behind me. It leads all the way around the entire facility. Here's another view of the lake. In the evening we had a leisurely dinner with Mike and Ilse and we spent the night close by in the beautiful Grand Village Hotel. And on the following day, we entered the Grand Teton Park. Even though it was September, we could see snow on top of the mountains. This is a well-known view of the mirror image of the mountain. I believe there are many jigsaw puzzles that have shown this picture. You should just look at the next four pictures without my comments. But we're not getting through. Later on, we uh, pulled into Jackson, which is a nice little town right in the valley, surrounded by mountains. Nice stores on Main Street. Our cute little hotel is right in the middle of downtown. And this is a very photogenic stuffed bison. This is kind of an unusual gate leading into the town park. It's actually made up of elk antlers that were collected by Boy Scouts. Towards the evening, we had decided to participate in the chuck wagon cookout and show. You can see us sitting among two other groups that will join us. We are receiving instructions on what to expect. We can see the covered wagons in the parking lot. The first batch has already left. 
And now it's our turn. The rubber wheels are a concession to the 21st century. A cowboy is riding ahead to make sure that we are not attacked. And it's gotten to be quite a long column. Now watch out. Here come the Indians, wearing war paint. A lot of hollering. This looks mighty dangerous. I observe that these Indians don't seem to have the right skin color. Well, I guess they must be albinos. We were lucky this time and were able to get away, unharmed, and then we arrive at our destination. It turned out to be a heated shed. Tables are set, and in front is a stage with musicians playing western music. In back is a chuck wagon with a field kitchen. We're being served a tasty meal, and then comes the show. People are picked out of the audience and publicly humiliated. At such times I realize that even after 59 years, we're still not totally free of our European upbringing. These people, be they Australian or whatever, are much more relaxed. Fortunately, we didn't have to participate. And when we got to the wagons for the return trip, Yuta was missing. And when I told Chris, he grinned and said, You lucky dog. For the next day, we had booked the uh, Snake River float trip. This trip did not have any of us do the rowing. It was just a calm cruise on the Snake River. We saw a mama duck with quite a few little ducklings following her and were told that ducks provided babysitting service for other mothers and then they took turns. We admired the mountains on both sides and saw a large beautiful house on shore and were told that the actor Harrison Ford lived there. We also noticed the large dam and found out that it is controlled when the water level gets too low in order to release water for the potato farmers in nearby Idaho. We also heard that Harrison Ford can sometimes be seen walking along on the dam. We saw a total of 13 eagles and some ospreys. And then later in the afternoon we had a chance to spend some time on our own in Jackson where we bought a runner for our living room table. Just outside Jackson is a large nature preserve where elks can roam freely. Today we uh, uh, drove to Salt Lake City in Utah, the home of the Mormons. But on our way we came through the city of Montpelier where we found this sign bragging about the fact that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid robbed the local bank back in 1896. Our first impression of Salt Lake City was the enormous temple. This year is a statue of Joseph Smith, who is the founder of the Mormons. And this is a picture of Gordon Hinckley. He's the current prophet. And Chris came up with this wisecrack. He said, since Mormons can have more than one wife, you could say that Hinckley believed in prophet sharing. And Michael, our Aussie friend, remarked, that Mormon means more men, and Brigham Young, a famous prophet, stands for Bring Them Young. This is the inside of the temple, and here's the stage for the famous Tabernacle Choir, but unfortunately we didn't have a chance to hear them perform. On the way into the temple, we passed by this beautiful little fountain. You may be aware of it, that Mormons tithe 10% of their incomes even corporations. And known Mormon companies are the Warsaw Insurance Company and Marriott, the big hotel chain. On top of the temple we saw this trumpet blowing angel. In the evening we had a nice dinner in town, but first we had to sign up for a membership. We found that rather strange, but the Mormons are running the town pretty much, and since they do not like alcohol and even coffee, this little gimmick was devised in order to get around the law. If you are a member of a private club, it's okay. Strange, isn't it? On our way to Bryce Canyon, we saw another one of Chris's films, Westward Expansion, where we found out that the Mormons were no angels when it came to the natives. During a rest stop, I saw this picture. This was the way the people traveled around the parks, a far cry from our comfortable coach, isn't it? Our next stop was Bryce Canyon. It was amazing. 
nothing but sagebrush for many miles and then all of a sudden this gorgeous vista it was absolutely breathtaking just look at the next 15 pictures we did hit rain and fog and after spending a little time we decided to swing by again on the following day what a difference the first few pictures were taken in fog and the rest on the following clear day We saw this strange looking deer. It's a mule deer. Now you might think that it's a breed of a mule and a deer, but of course that's nonsense. It's just a strange kind of deer and the ears make it look like a mule. Next we came to the Zion National Park. A story it would tell. Down in the valley we had a chance to walk around a little and we noticed the dirty water. The rain had washed down from the mountains and had brought with it sand. This was a great view from under this overhang. Next stop is Lake Powell. Uh, just like uh, Yellowstone with the motorbikes, here you can rent houseboats. Yuta and myself at Lake Powell and Mike and Ilsa. Lake Powell is surrounded by strange rock formations. Wind and weather made them look smooth and brushed. We had decided to sign up for the Antelope Canyon Cruise. It's a 90-minute casual cruise on a fairly large boat around Lake Powell. We came through a number of canyons and wondered what might be on the other side of them. We were surprised by the smooth surface of the rock walls. We just had to find out about those canyons and so we signed up for the Antelope Canyon slot tour. The entrance to the canyons is from an Indian reservation. This is an autonomous territory and the Navajo Indians are running the show. They only permit a limited number of people to enter the canyons. It used to be more open, but of course someone had a smear graffiti on the walls, and also some years ago, 11 people drowned when water from Lake Powell streamed into the canyon. That can happen very suddenly. Young Navajo squaws were driving us in an all-wheel drive vehicles to the entrance of the canyon. And the entrance is, is quite impressive. It's very difficult to take pictures here, even though it will give you a pretty good idea. At times it is pitch dark, and then all of a sudden you see light. And this picture looks real shaky, but that was really the way it looked. It was a very odd effect. The views are always sudden and unexpected, and at the very top, people and animals can walk around and you wouldn't know it. Squaw who showed us around. At the end of the tour, we were brought back to a small local airport where we picked up our people who had gone on the helicopter ride. And for any of our German friends, look at this sign and see how they managed to butcher the German language. Nein Einflugloch. Really? 
The following pictures were sent to us by Mike and Ilse, who had booked a helicopter ride. So I will keep quiet while you have time to look at them. Most of the pictures are of the Grand Canyon, which is our next destination. Woman, you don't know me. You can bet that I know you. Everybody in this whole darn town knows you too. So we are on our way to the Grand Canyon. This is the famous observation tower. The view from here is one of the very best. The tower was built in 1932 and was designed by Mary Coulter. She was a well-known architect who was determined that the tower would be designed in such a way that it did not detract from the beauty of the area and she certainly succeeded. Uh, this is a descriptive plaque. Unfortunately you may have trouble reading it. This is another structure that she managed to integrate into the surroundings. This is another view of the same structure. And here you can see how it should not be done. The Indians came up with this one in order to raise some money. This is another view of that obscenity. What utter hypocrisy! On the one hand, the Indians keep harping about their holy sites and their desire to keep their natural sites virginal, and then just for the money, or in the case of Crazy Horse, probably out of spite, this monstrosity. Well, I guess we whites started it all with Rushmore. We had a chance for a short walk along the rim of the canyon and saw a deer grazing peacefully. Soon it will be sundown. One last look. And finally we see the sun go down over the canyon. Our hotel for the night is very close by. The suitcases are all lined up in the morning and Chris is there to supervise the boarding. 
Our driver is holding the door for us, gets behind the wheel and off we go on our way to Vegas. Looking back on the trip, it could not have been nicer, even the weather played along. So far, so good. Now comes the bad part. On the way into town, that is Vegas, we had to get out at the airport. We did not want to visit Vegas again since we had been there on previous visits and we did not want to stay over, so we got off. The wait for our flight to JFK was, believe it or not, eight hours. With another two-hour layover at JFK until we finally arrived in Albany. Monica and Peter picked us up and finally, after I don't know how many hours, we were home. Our bed is waiting. What a wonderful adventure it was, and I wish every one of you would have a chance to experience it.